Welcome to Illuminations, a program of study designed to guide you through the basic tools one needs to become a better painter. We intend to shed light on the theories, tools, and techniques that provide this foundation. Many of the subjects we'll explore seem to confuse even experienced painters when they're trying to do everything at once. Every stroke applied to a painting must exhibit the knowledge of composition, color, value, edge, linear, and aerial perspective. That's a tall order for a beginner, yet that's exactly what many try to do when they start painting. Actually, all these concepts are simple to understand when they're studied out of the context of trying to execute a painting. Join me for the entire Illumination series for a good basic introduction to the theories, tools, methods, and techniques every painter can use when you're in a hurry and don't have time to set up and paint, you can accomplish a great deal with a small drawing pad and a soft 2B school pencil. Drawing tools everyone has at hand. I like to use a pencil that has no wood casing and is made entirely of graphite. I can use it on its point or on its side, just like the soft charcoal. It's a bit dirtier to use this way because the graphite will get on your hands, but a wet travel tissue can be all the cleanup you need. I like a soft 6B pencil that makes really dense, dark values without pressing too hard on the paper. Cast shadows are as important to the creation of the illusion of volume as anything you put on the volume itself. If you'll notice, the feeling of the roundness at the bottom of the sphere occurs because of the depth of the cast shadow. We also know that it's rounded because this cast shadow comes all the way under the bottom. The, the sphere itself doesn't touch the table surface. We know because we can't see the, the point where it's actually sitting on the surface. So this is an important point to remember that the cast shadow of a sphere comes all the way across the bottom, even though it's very, very slight here. As with any cast shadow from any light source, the shadow is densest and darkest right next to the object that's casting the shadow. As it moves away from the object, it gets lighter in value itself. Sometimes the cast shadow will completely disappear into another form, or it may be very highly uh, structured with an edge, but it does get lighter as it moves away from the object that's casting the shadow. Now, you have to look at every object in a still life individually. Once you des determine where everything is according to the rules, then you have to look at the object and see if it's being affected by something sitting next to it. Before I check in on those things that are next to it, I want to go ahead and put the reflected light in that I know is going to be there. It's a long piece of it down the neck. And then I'll softly blend So far, we've used a consistent light source in all the objects we've seen. That has created a situation where we observe all the shapes and volumes under the same lighting conditions. To be fully aware of these conditions, I want to show you how I've set up the objects for demonstration. First, I constructed a, set, a stage similar to the proscenium opening that you might see if you went to a live theater production. Three sides and a top. Block the light that illuminates the setup except the light from the front. Second, I turned off all the lights in the studio so that there was no ambient light falling on the setup from more than one direction. Then I chose a single spotlight to illuminate the subject. Any other light on the objects is reflected light. If you work in a studio that has north light, with no supplemental artificial light, 
then you'll have the same effect without the need for a spotlight. If your studio has additional windows on the south, east, or west side, however, you should completely block out any light coming from those sources so you'll be in more control of the light. How can we explain lighting situations that don't follow the classic model? If you paint from a setup that has multiple light sources, then you have to take into account all those sources and how they affect what you're seeing. For example, if I turn on all the studio lights, and we have about 12 of them in this room, then you see a marked difference in the shadow sides of the objects in the setup, even with the three-sided box, which eliminates light from four directions. The result is a weakening of the volumetric forms, and the focus of the setup is no longer on just the light-dark shadow pattern, but rather on the contour of the entire setup. In this situation, the relationship between the positive shapes and negative spaces becomes as important and sometimes more important than the shadow patterns within the setup. If we remove the box that encloses the setup to allow light to come in from all directions simultaneously, it becomes even more confusing about lights and darks and less powerful. You'll see that the folds take on many of the simple shapes we studied earlier in the program. The cone, the cylinder, and in some cases even the side of a cube. We see the core shadows and the reflected light within these forms just as we did on the individual volumes. Draperies are fun and challenging to do because you can take liberty with their key according to what you want to emphasize in your composition. If you want to create a strong directional movement in one direction, you create more contrast in the fold to draw the eye in that direction. If you don't want to draw the eye, for instance, out of the canvas with a continuation of a fold, then decrease the contrast in the form shadows and the eye won't be drawn to that area. Join me in future programs where we will delve more deeply into some of the subjects and ideas we've discussed today. Until then, enjoy painting and drawing.